Hi, and welcome to this week's show. So I, if you've been listening to the podcast, I recently just quit my job and decided to go into art full-time. And I kind of made that announcement last week. So I figured what better way to mix things up that are already mixed up uh, than to also rebrand myself. I've decided instead of being underneath the American Bandito umbrella of whatever the heck it is that it was, uh, I'm just going to be under my name. I'm just going to be going forward as Tom Ray from now on. Uh, Back in 2017, when I started this whole thing, basically, I had an idea that I wanted to do something. I didn't know what it was going to be, what I was going to do. But the first step was I wanted to make a website. So I went to an expired domain search and just looked at what expired domains were available that day. And one of them was AmericanBandito.com. So I used that because I thought, okay, you know, it's here I am a uh, high school dropout who somehow became a software developer and I should not be where I am in life right now based on pretty much everything that's happened to me. So you know, it's kind of just like, you know, I've been living by my own rules, that sort of thing, whatever. I made it make sense at the time. And also, I just was afraid to put my own name out there. I was kind of hiding behind it. I, ironically, the logo that I drew for it was kind of a play on that because I was hiding behind a mask. And that's what the name was. It was so I didn't have to expose my own name if it failed. But I've gotten more used to putting myself out there. I'm I'm more comfortable doing what I do. When people come up to me and ask me what I do, I have to say the name and explain what it is. And then I go, it's comics, but it's also a podcast, but I'm also a musician. So it's, if you say that they don't know what it is that this name represented. But if you say I'm a musician and I do comics and I do a podcast, it's just me. They're just going, Oh, you do all that. And I do, it just makes more sense. So that's what I'm going to be changing it to right now. It's just Tom Ray. And anybody who knows me, when I first told them what I was going to call it, they said, I'm amazed you didn't call it Tom Ray, because jokingly, I love to annoy everyone by inserting my name into stuff. And all my friends are fully aware of that. I like to insert it into songs like uh, Axel F, uh, Beverly Hills Cop. So it would be like Tom Ray, Tom Ray, Tom, Tom Ray, stuff like that. I would do that all the time. For me to do this is actually something people are not going to be surprised who know me that I've done it. And the actual domain, TomRay.com, I would have used that, but the person who owns that, it's not even a website. They bought the domain and they want $25,000 for it. So that's ridiculous, but at the same time, it's like pretty cool that my name is worth $25,000, but I can't do that yet. I decided instead to go with the inserting my name into stuff, I bought the domain name TomRay'sWebsite.com. So that's where my stuff is going to be right now, TomRay'sWebsite.com. And I'm going to start just putting Tom Ray in front of the stuff I do. So it will be Tom Ray's Art Podcast. So that's what it's called from now on. And the first guest that I have on the show that it's really weird I'm doing this in the middle of the season. But the first guest on Tom Ray's Art Podcast is Taco Cat Creations here in Madison. And they make cat toys because it is their passion. They love cats. And we talk about how that came to be the business that they now do full-time, both of them. And they also run the Madison Makers Market here in town. They took over for the person that ran it before who moved away, and now they're running it. So we talk about that as well. It's a fascinating story. On with the show, and you can hear more about it. I'm Tom Ray, and this is my art podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet... I'm Megan Porter. I am co-owner of Taco Cat Creations. I do most of the sewing, the designing. My name is David Van. I am the other stuff guy. I do the logistics, the finance. I do all the graphic design and branding. We met up at the coffee shop right outside of my train car. And the first thing I had to ask them about was if they don't mind that I'm a dog person. I mean, it's hard not to like dogs. I like dogs, but like only on a dog by dog basis. I don't. I don't want to say that I like all dogs. No, I don't like all dogs either, and not all dogs like me. We were fostering a dog actually uh, early this year. We had her for maybe two, two and a half months, and just that little bit of time was so much hotter. That one animal was so much hotter than seven cats. I always tell people just seven. 
because people ask, like, I think we were joking a few months ago that, like, if you killed somebody, your dog would, like, still come, you'd still come home and your dog would be like, oh, my God, I'm so happy to see you. You killed somebody. That's so great. And your cat would be like, yeah, me too. When's dinner? Like, like you have to be suspicious of something that's, like, always super happy to see you. I love that joke, but that was super dark, and I love that, too. <laughs> And then now here's something I'm going to take the opportunity to ask. I have no clue what catnip is. What's the deal? The best example people have told me is like it's a pot for cats. Yeah, and in a nutshell, that's pretty accurate. So catnip is actually a member of the uh, mint family. So what's really interesting about it is that it is its own unique cultivar that's evolved independently uh, from mint a long, long time ago. It's been going on for millions of years. Mint. Yeah. Uh, If you think about it, the actual odor is surprisingly similar. The actual shape of the leaves is also actually not that far off, if you think about it. But the real defining dissimilarity between them is the active chemical in catnip which is uh, called nepetalactone. <laughs> it's a combination of two different chemical compounds, and uh, one of them, you might have heard the lactone part, it's lactose, it's a milk sugar, which, believe it or not, occurs outside of cows. <laughs> so what happens is when a cat consumes it, it they decompose that chemical compound and uh, process the lactose, and then they're left over with the remaining compound, which very similarly to humans, they actually have chemical receptors that are compatible with the shape of those molecules and function in much the same way. It basically just causes a dopamine and serotonin buildup in their system and makes them extremely happy and uh, or just extremely like exaggerates their behavior based on how that system works in each cat. Not all cats have this reaction. I think it's something like only about 80% of cats are receptive to catnip, but they are all receptive by the same process. I tell people it activates a gene in their brain that either makes them like crazy or calm or crazy then calm, and it tends to kick in as soon as they hit puberty, which for cats is around six months old. Very different from one cat to another. Even in our own like brood, our own murder of cats, whatever you want to call it, clowder, I think is the official, yeah. We have one of our cats doesn't care about catnip at all. I also feel like it depends on the strain because Cleo is... 12 and her whole life the whole time I've had her she's never reacted to catnip and then we got this toy like a few months ago that all seven of them are playing with so and I've never seen her react to catnip before so that's the other thing I tell people is like if you buy a cheap catnip if you buy an old catnip something that's dried out or exposed to air like it's not going to be as potent as something that has been on the shelf a shorter time so our catnip's pretty strong. A majority of the stuff you do involves that, right? Yep, yep, exactly. I think every product that we sell has catnip in it, unless it's like the bow ties. ties. We've actually been asked about that before, so I feel like I have to go out and point out that everything here has catnip in it, except for the bow ties. I've been sewing since I was four years old. Um, my dad taught me how to sew. We didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up, so my dad was like, you you know, can't have new clothes, here's how to fix holes, here's how to sew buttons, that kind of thing. So I did that, and I learned how to use a sewing machine in home ec. And then when I was in college, I had a theater scholarship because I thought that I would go into acting, and then... And you thought you would go into acting. What happened there? Yeah, so I double majored in English and theater because I always liked doing plays and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'll just, and I always wanted to be a writer. So I was like, I'll just do both. And then when I got to college, like everybody in the theater department was way more serious than I was about doing theater. And I was like, I just, I just want to do plays. Like, I don't know about this whole getting into character <laughs> thing. But I still had to fulfill my scholarship. So I worked in the costume shop. Part of the scholarship was you had to work on a play a semester. So I worked in the costume shop making costumes, altering costumes, fitting costumes. I worked in the uh, dressing rooms putting makeup on men and that kind of stuff. So That seems oddly specific. Why, why was it just for men? I was always assigned to the men's dressing room for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it's because I didn't take any crap from them. But <laughs> like, the, the actresses were always... <laughs> the actresses were always way harder to deal with. But anyway, when... I graduated from college. I went into writing. I worked at a newspaper, but I only did it a couple of days a week. So I needed something else to pay the bills. So I applied and got a job at Mad Cat Pet Supplies here in town because I was like, I'll just pet cats all day. This will be super easy. <laughs> but I'm sure that's exactly what the job description was. Yeah, yeah. We, we help people with their cats. And I had a cat at the time, just only one cat at the time. But uh So I've been working there for about 10 years, and at a certain point, 
I decided that I didn't want to, what does Ron, Ron Swanson say? Like, you don't want to half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. So I was like, what if I just worked at one job and my newspaper job couldn't offer me full-time hours and Mad Cat could. So we are hanging around one day and my boss, Ted, was like, hey, we used to have this product. It looked like this. It had this long tail. And he knew that, like, I could make stuff that I was like crafty Mm -hmm. but I didn't even have a sewing machine at the time like I knew how to use one and he's like do you think you could make something like this for us and I was like yeah give it a shot so like I bought a sewing machine on Craigslist and seven years later (laughs) this is my job but uh it's from the beginning so that product that first product was called Mad Rats it's basically just a catnip toy that's about the size of my hand and then it's got like an 18 inch long tail and it's totally stuffed with catnip and it's my most popular toy. Oh, you're still making it. Yep. It's it's still our most popular toy. It has the worst margin ever because it has like three ounces of catnip in it. And I hand stuff them all. So so we've come out with other things that have like better margins. How do you make that turn? Like you're working for them and you had to turn around and go, hey, I need to start charging you for these even though you work there. Like how does that happen? I wasn't like making them on the clock. It was like, here's 36 of these Mad Rats. Here's the wholesale price that I have to charge you. And... You know, we were really official from the beginning. Like, I would cut them an invoice. They would cut me a check. And it was a nice, like, little side hustle for a while. I did another version of those called Nerd Rats. So they're, like, nerdy fabrics, um, which is also Ted's suggestion. Like, it was a very collaborative, like, hey, it'd be cool if we had this. And, you know, he's he's been in the pet industry for over 20 years. So, like, he's seen everything. He's worked with everybody. And... For me to have access to knowledge like that is awesome, but yeah. then also for him to have access like, to somebody who can develop products is, I, I would assume it's awesome for him too, because they work with a lot of like independent, we call them like direct retailers. So in the retail industry, like you either buy things from a distributor or you buy things directly from the manufacturer. And buying things from the distributor is super easy because you place an order, it comes once a week, and you really don't have to do any legwork other than, like, counting and placing an order. With that also comes, like, you can only stack what the distributor offers you. And so Mad Cat has always made the effort to work with smaller companies. So, like, there's dozens of small companies that they work with just to get the variety that people that other people don't have. That's why if you go into like a pet supply store, for example, and you feel like you're seeing a lot of the same things all the time, it's because the distributor only services this one area and they only offer these certain things. And so that's all you have to choose from. I literally make these like one at a time, you know. So it's been really neat to have that collaborative relationship and also to have the expertise of like all my coworkers because if we're thinking about like making something, I have 20 people who could test it. The rough rats, when we started making those canvas rats, that was a huge uh, thing because we were really interested in making a product that was durable enough to hold up to some of the crazier, more uh, insane cats that are out there. So we just tested out with some customers that we knew uh, through Mad Cat that were having some issues with our stuff not lasting very long. So we gave it out to them for free just to try these things out, just to see how they work and then took all the feedback that we got from them about it. And uh, when we knew we had a good solid product, then we launched it out to the public. I think our record on the Rough Rats now is um, uh, three months before total destruction. Because it's gonna break, unless you make it out of steel. It really depends on the cat, like a normal, like non-insane or non-like half tiger cat. A regular rat can last years. Uh, We have uh, one that my cat Fizzle stole from us on the production line about three years ago and she still has it and it still works. She still plays with it after three years. So what is the process of making these? Because you have a lot of them. It's evolved a lot. This year we hired somebody who started out as my production assistant. Her name is Carol. She's more of my production manager because she's much more organized than I am and she's able to kind of look at everything that we have to do like non-biased. How did you find her? We put an ad on Facebook for just a production assistant, and she turned out to be not only be interested, but like a friend of a friend of ours. So 
or is it a subordinate of like my best friend? Such a small town, but she also had like costume shop experience. So costume shop experience. Yep, yep. So she's a theater person, and one of the things that I always learned in the costume shop that I kind of carry with me is like it doesn't have to be perfect. Oh, you mean like as a career? I was literally picturing a costume shop, and I was like, "There's a costume shop around here." Oh no, no, no! Like theater, like a costume, costuming for theater. The person who was in charge of my costume shop always impressed upon me was like, "It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be done." Like, nobody is going to care if your hem is perfect if the actress is late for her cue. Nobody sitting in the cheap seats is going to be able to see your stitching. It just needs to be shorter. It just The corset just needs to fit so that it doesn't stab the actress. <laughs> like, it just has to be done. And so with the volume of production that we do, we like to think that we get everything perfect all the time, but sometimes it's just more important to try to think about, like, well, what will people actually see, what's important structurally, and then just get it pushed out the door, because you can spend forever making something look perfect, and at the end of the day, you're going to throw it on the floor and a cat's going to chew on it. That's a good point. And there's, I mean, there's also, you know, gains in attrition that you need to look at, because our entire process has turned into a full-blown assembly line. We have figured out that there are individual stages in producing a given product, and if you do all of that one stage for a hundred different examples of one toy one step at a time then it actually saves you a lot of time in the long run and you also tend to be more consistent when you do one thing at a time like when you do make errors you're bound to make fewer per certain amount of products and it's a lot easier to catch them because they tend to be a lot more glaring faults. One of the things that Carol is really good at is objectively looking at everything that we have to do which is a never-ending list and then making a like to-do list for us every single day. What I love to do is make things and what I don't love to do is set a to-do list because if I have to do that everything feels like an emergency all the time yeah. and that's not good for our employees mental health it's not good for my mental health she's really good at saying like here's what we need to do here's what we're capable of accomplishing in one day and then of course like by Wednesday everything changes because Mad Cat places a huge order or something like that. And then I do this basically as my full-time job. I'm still at Mad Cat like one morning a week just for getting to see people and buying my cat food. And Dave does this uh, as his full-time job now too. And what were you doing before? I was the uh, head distiller at Old Sugar Distillery for a few years. Wonderful job. Absolutely delicious products. I used to have a job that made me really, really unhappy. I just didn't want to be there anymore. So this opportunity came up to work at the distillery. Um, it sounded like it was really interesting and really different, but the pay was really low. But I brought it up to Megan and she was very supportive. She knew it was going to be a big hit on the paycheck, but she was just sick of seeing me unhappy and miserable and stressed all the time. So she encouraged me to go for the job and I went for it and I hit it off with Nathan immediately. I had a great time talking to him and he decided to hire me right off the bat. But I, that guy is probably the best boss I've ever had. Just as far as like somebody who like rolls with a punch in and is willing to like teach you and learn with you about stuff. On top of that, as Taco Cat has grown, he was another just great resource because he's a small business owner, so he's been there. He's seen all these different stages of growth happen, and he was just such an amazing resource because he knew that, it, I think he knew the whole time that it was just a matter of time before I couldn't work there anymore, but he still continually offered advice and help and support, and just, you know, he respected the fact that we were small business owners and we were just trying to make this work, and he was trying to help us out every step of the way because he got it. More of the show after this break. I was wholesaling for like three years, and I was also managing Mad Cat's West Side location. So that was like a 45-hour-a-week thing. And then I was doing Taco Cat in my spare time and just like trying to keep up with orders. And I had a Etsy shop that I didn't really pay attention to because I don't do computers that well. But I, I had things on there, and... I think it was like in November 2016, we went to the crafty fair, which was on a Sunday, which I was like super stoked about because I always work Saturday, so I couldn't go to cool stuff like that. I was like, I'm going to get presents for all my coworkers. I'm, it's going to be the coolest. I'm going to like find all these things from artists that you've never seen before. But I actually didn't buy anything there because all of my coworkers are cat people. We can't be the only cat people looking for other cat people at this kind of thing like we could do this at the time we had the mad rats the nerd rats we had a smaller 
catnip product called Mew Mice. So I was like, we could do this. Like, this doesn't seem that hard. <laughs> I don't know if I said that, but I was like, we have a product line. I've been wholesaling for three years. Like, we could sell directly to people. And I think a few weeks later, we were coming home from um, Thanksgiving, and I just remember being like, really unhappy and just kind of having a conversation with myself, which is unusual for me. Like, I'm not a super introspective person, but I just had this, like, conversation with myself where I was like, I'm really unhappy. If I could do anything all day long, what would I do? I was like, well, I would work on Taco Cat. It's like two voices having this conversation. The first voice is like, that would never work. Like, you could never do that. You could never make enough money. You're going to end up living in a box and like under a bridge with your kitties. Like, there's no way that you could ever make enough money doing that. And then the second voice was like, well, what if you just like tried? What if you tried? What if you just did it a little bit? Because I knew I'd always have a home at Mad Cat. Like, what if like money was no option? What if you didn't worry about it? And what if you just tried? And then it was just sort of this idea that I couldn't get out of my head. Like it just kind of rattles around in there behind everything else. And I decided that I was going to cut back my hours. I was going to step down from my manager position and cut back my hours to four days a week, which doesn't sound like a lot, but like I'm not good at math. But even I know that like if you cut down four days a week, you're losing 20% of your guaranteed income, like the guaranteed paycheck that you know you're getting every week that's going to cover all your bills. Like you have to make up for that difference. You have to hustle that much harder. So I told Ted, I was like, I'm going to step down. I'm going to work on Taco Cat. And he was like, okay. I think it was like a 30-second conversation. <laughs> but She went through all this inner turmoil, and you're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I was like, great. I'll have three whole days a week that I can work on this. It'll be awesome. I'll catch up on all my orders. I'll get all my stuff done. We'll do the crafty fair. So we signed up for the crafty fair, which was in April. And then I just, like, proceeded to have a three-month-long heart attack because, like, doing craft fairs is not easy. And especially if you're, like, a creative person that makes things. I've never had to design a craft fair booth before. Like, there's no, like, shop that you go to that, like, you can buy everything for your craft fair booth. There's nobody who tells you how to do it. There was a point where we used to take all the furniture out of the dining room so that we could set up the booth in the dining room just to make sure we had it all laid out the way we wanted. We knew exactly what we were going to do. And the cats were crawling all over it and because I was like, oh my god, I have this deadline. Now I have, I, ha- I signed up for this. I have to do this. And we got through it. We had enough inventory, and it went great. Was it always as big as the booth that you have right now, or did you start out small? Well, it depends on the craft fair, because like the crafty fair that year was a 10 by 10, so a lot of craft fairs will give you a 10 by 10 booth, which is a lot of space. That's like the size booth that we have when we vent adjacent to the farmer's market on the weekends. But then some craft fairs, like I think last weekend I had a booth that was 9 foot by 4 foot, and so I was basically like walking sideways, <laughs> like because I just had my tables. So you you adapt to the amount of space that they give you in, in your contract. So we had enough to fill the booth, but like I still look at pictures and it's just it's changed so much from from where we started that it's pretty amazing to see. But we had such a good time at the crafty fair and it was also sort of like as we get busier and as we hire people and I remember Dave saying to me one time like wouldn't it be nice to not have to go to craft fairs every weekend like to just send an employee to a craft fair and I was like craft fairs are a ton of work but I love doing craft fairs because you actually get to see people interact with the things that you make you know like otherwise I just sit in the studio all day and sew and listen to podcasts and watch Food Network and like and I'll agree with you I'm like I've, I've done a few pop-ups and afterwards I'll be like oh I didn't actually really sell that much but it's like I met tons and tons of people yeah you get to see people like walk up and just be surprised and delighted by your work. And that would be something that I would totally miss out on if I wasn't sitting at a craft fair for eight hours. I think that's really important to the customers, too, because I think once you can put a face to the product, I feel like that uh, really connects a lot more with people to be actually see the person who, like, put all this together and put all this work into this thing. And for these small businesses, because you actually have so much more of a personal connection 
to your audience. And, you know, nobody has that at these big box stores and retail locations. I always tell people my dad taught me how to sell and now he works for me. And then Carol is our full-time employee. We hired another person, Sherry, to help us get through the holidays. That's the person that makes the zipper earrings. Yeah, she does. She does. Um, I met her. She's very nice. She's awesome. Clipped arts. Yep. Oh, my sister-in-law helps me with the farmer's market on the weekends, too. And she has her own business that she does craft fairs, too, now. So even with hiring Carol was like to for me to maybe take a day off a week. And it seems like we're never catching up. Like the work just I mean, we're working all the time, but the work just expands to fill the space that we have, which I feel very lucky. Like, it's better than having the opposite problem, I always tell people, but it would be nice to have a day off once in a while. Oh, stop it, it would not. You'd be bored as hell. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Taco Cat actually travels to a lot of different events and pop-ups and things all over the U.S., and I asked them about that. And one of the things they told me, which is something I've been thinking about, is that they, at first, rigged up a very small car that technically isn't supposed to be able to tow anything, to be able to carry their stuff out on the road with them. So we drove out to California with Taco Cat in a Honda Fit, towing a trailer, which you're not supposed to do. Oh yeah, you're right. (laughs) There's actually a catch to that. So I, I, I feel like I had to point this out. Specifically in the North American market, Honda Fits are not towing rated. But if you go to Canada or Mexico or any other market that they are sold in, they are rated for, I think it's 1,800 pounds towing. It's that specifically Americans are too stupid to drive such a small car towing a trailer. I don't know if you've noticed, but he's a car guy. (laughs) I I kind of got that, but my next question was going to be, does it even have a hitch? It didn't, but when you buy one and bolt it in, it does. (laughs) I'm wondering because I'm right now trying to find out if I have the ability to do such a thing with a Mitsubishi Mirage. Uh, yes, you absolutely can. So there's a catch um, with the Honda Fit. I had to use a Dremel tool with like a diamond tip grinder bit, but you can actually like pop out the holes in the back of the frame and you can actually bolt it right in. Um, there are companies that make uh, the hitches and all you have to do is just cut the right hole and you can pop it right in there. You can tow a 1300 pound trailer up the Grand Tetons. But I don't recommend it because it's terrifying. I was going to say, it doesn't sound like it would have been easy. No. We bought a van when we came home. So. <laughs> That's the other thing I'm looking into. Yeah. People knock minivans, but you can haul so much stuff mm-hmm. in a minivan. So we went to we went to CatCon, <laughs> and on the way back, we stopped at like Yosemite and, and things like that. Another thing that happened is they also took over a lot of the Madison Maker markets for the person in town here who used to run them. Um, What happened was this person uh, moved to Madison because they wanted to start doing craft fairs and uh, their wife uh, got a job out here, started going to college out here. Sarah. Sarah Tomto. She uh, currently runs I Heard Indie Markets. So she started organizing her own craft fairs and she had this really cool idea of like, what if we combined like the two most popular things in the Midwest, shopping and drinking, into a singular experience. So she started this thing called the Madison Makers Market, which is literally a bar crawl and a craft fair in one. So she started organizing the events, started putting all this stuff together, getting all these vendors together, and it was going really well. And we got in on the second one of them, I think, maybe the second or third yeah, event that she we ever did. Des Moines for the first one that she did. Otherwise, we probably signed up for it. And one of the venues, uh, it, it was sort of spread out a few different places at once, and one of the venues was Old Trigger Distillery, where I was working. Mm-hmm. So I had seen the event happen, uh, the second one, from behind the bar, and I saw just how crazy it was and how busy it was. And then we actually started attending as vendors, and it was really, really cool. And I started to get to know Sarah and realize that she was a really cool person, really interesting, really motivated. After a while, I actually started helping work with her on the events. And one thing led to another, and uh, her wife got a professorship in Michigan. And she could not take that job, so she moved uh, out of state with her. But before she did, she asked if I wanted to take over the whole market. And I was like, oh, my God, the Madison Makers Market. And then I was like, oh, but we'll miss you. But the Madison Makers Market. Because it's like half a mile from our house, and we always do really, really well there. So then when she asked if I wanted to take over, I was like, well, yeah. We uh, decided to, like, cooperatively organize the August market this year, like, take on the whole thing step-by-step together, completely work through front to back, just so I had a better grasp of every single step of the process. Right before the August market, she moved out of state. I kind of ran the whole thing that day. 
which is, I think, where I saw you. After that, it was all me. So the last weekend, we had the Black Friday market, which was the biggest market we've ever had today with the most vendors at the most locations. And I had to do that entire thing by myself, which was both like amazing and terrifying all at once. And now I'm just trying to find ways to improve it, make it grow, make it more popular. And Dave's a graphic designer, too. So Dave and Sarah are both graphic designers, so they do all the graphic design, you you do the graphic designing now, but he does all the graphic design for Taco Cat still and all, all of the managing of all that. The name, how did you come up with Taco Cat? <laughs> so I had always gone by the name um, Mad Rat Cat Toys because that was the thing that I made and Dave came in to help me and said, like, you need packaging, you need a name, you need a brand because that's what he went to college for, like that's what he does. and. I was like, okay, well, let's think of a name. And it took us three months. Like, it, honestly, we thought of every stupid... We would go on long bike rides and just yell out, like, every stupid... Did you see thought clouds with, like, different names in your heads? Yeah, and we we agree on a lot of things, but then sometimes we get, like, really passionate about the one thing that we're, like, not going to budge on. And I had really liked Orange Cat Creations or something like that because two of our cats are orange cats, and orange cats are the best cats, and I'll fight you if you disagree with me. But I don't, care. I don't know if you have this with, with dogs, but with cats, like, or at least with our cats, like, do you ever just say, like, really stupid nonsense things to them? Okay, so we were cooking. I was holding our cat, Mackie, and I was, like, holding him upside down, and I was... <laughs> I was like, oh, Mackie, I'm going to fold you up and eat you like a taco. <laughs> and then I looked at him and I was like, taco cat. And because it's a palindrome and I have an English degree, so now I'm using it. Um, it's spelled the same forwards and backwards. Like race car. Race car. That's my favorite palindrome. Mm -hmm. it, when I, whenever anyone asks me, I'm like, race car is the best. Hannah, mom. A Toyota. Oh, wow. We drive a Toyota, too. But uh, I was like, oh, my God, we should be Taco Cat. And we both like alliteration, so. Taco Cat, it's a palindrome that ends with the same letters. So there's a little bit of that. And then Creations fits in with the hard K sound in cat. It just makes so much sense. It's just so pleasing to the ear. So we, like, I stopped cooking and went to go design the logo right then and there. A few minutes later, came up with this guy. And, you know, we never, I remember, like, telling Ted and Amy, like, okay, our new name is Taco Cat. And they were both like, what is that? <laughs> like, now we're like, well, it's, you know, the two best things in the world, taco and, tacos and cats. You can learn more about Taco Cat Creations at their website, tacocatcreations.com. The music for this episode is by my band, Lorenzo's Music, at lorenzosmusic.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. I'll be back next time, so until then, so long. <laughs>